morning. Good morning. Today we'll be using a new hymn of praise to God in glory. You heard the tune in this morning's prelude. It will be familiar to some of you. The words of this first stanza were written by the well-known gospel hymn written of the 19th century Fanny Crosby. The second stanza is from hymn number 507 in the hymnal. Kelly will give us an introduction and then we will join in. I know we'll find the hymn of praise expresses well our joy in the Lord, to whom we give glory for all that he is and all that he has done. Welcome and concern this day. Rooted in the past and growing into the future, the church must always be reformed in order to live out the love of Christ in an ever-changing world. We celebrate the good news of God's grace, that Jesus Christ set us free every day to do this life-transforming work. Trusting in the freedom given to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we pray for the church that Christians will unite more fully in worship and mission. Our interest in is 229 in the Green Book, a mighty fortress of our God. Please stand.
all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts with the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and with the name magnify the holy name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just <clears throat> will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all <coughs> our sins, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs>
Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies for the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
second reading announcement. Paul's word stands at the heart of the preaching of Martin Luther and other Reformation leaders. Human beings do not make themselves right with God through works of the law. We are brought into a right relationship with God through the divine activity centered in Christ's death. This act is a gift of grace that liberates us from sin and empowers our faith in Jesus Christ. I'm reading from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effected through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. That what because of boasting, it is excluded. By what law? By that of works. No, but by that of law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. The words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham, and have never been, in, been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son who has a place, but the son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. church did not begin in 1517. The church was over a thousand years old before uh, Luther came along. The church began when? On what? Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday. Now, I think we all know the basic background of Reformation because we know that in the Middle Ages, what was happening is there were these uh, 
dealers going around selling what are called indulgences. And some people think that that was a uh, payment to take away your sins. That was what it was for. Your sins were taken away through confession and so on, but there was still some punishment because you'd been naughty. And so if you had an indulgence, it took away some of the punishment that you were supposed to endure after life in this world. Well, it had gotten all out of hand, as I think we know from our history. And Luther said, no, this is not right. You, you can't offer God anything. You, if you're going to be punished, you're going to be punished. If you're not, you're not going to be punished. God has these things under his control. So to protest this sale of these uh, letters of remission, or what you call them, he uh, went to the church door there in Wittenberg, Germany, and he went on All Saints Eve. Now, we, as we know, All Saints Day is November 1st, and he knew that a lot of people would be coming to the church on All Saints Day, so he uh, went, as I say, on uh, Halloween, All Hallows Eve, that's where we get the word, uh, All Saints Eve, and nailed the, uh, the theses there on the, do on the door to protest. Uh, the sale of indulgences. I mean, they had these big coffers and you drop your money in and so on. It was re really out of hand, totally out of hand. But the church must be reformed in every age, as I think we all recognize and acknowledge. So to begin, what, what is unique to the church, anyhow, the Christian church? Is it helping those in need? Well, we do that. But other agencies do that as well, don't they? How about the, the Red Cross and Volunteers of America and such uh, organizations? Is it supporting moral behavior? Well, other religions have a moral standard that uh, they conform to. How about Bible study? Well, we study the Bible very diligently, but other agencies, groups, uh, also study the Bible. Uh, sometimes people who are totally atheists know the scriptures, at least what's in them, uh, better than some Christians do. So what is unique to the Christian church? It's coming to God through Jesus Christ. It's worshiping God through Jesus Christ. What are we just saying? Come to the Father through Jesus, his Son. Our link to God is in the person of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son and our Lord. And what do Christians do? Well, we gather. We gather on Sunday, the day of resurrection. And the book of Acts describes Christian activity in assembly. And it says here, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, that is the word, and in fellowship, the breaking of bread, that is communion, and prayers. And our Christian worship today, despite 2,000 years of history, is essentially the same thing. We have the word, the sacrament, the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread. Now, Christian worship has had many names over the years. I think you know them. Breaking the bread, breaking the bread. I like, I like that one, you know. Uh, the Lord's Supper, okay. Uh, the Eucharist, that means Thanksgiving. Recall, as we'll soon do again, we'll, I'll say, uh, let, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, and you'll say, it is right to give thanks and praise. This is one of the most ancient parts of Christian worship after the uh, Bible was settled. Holy Communion. And then, most commonly, uh, the service is called the Mass. Not so much here in this country by Protestants, but uh, I guess it's usually associated with the Roman Catholic Church, but it is used in uh, uh, Lutheran context as well. Luther said this, he said, I'm quoting him now, we therefore first assert, it is not now, nor ever has been, our intention 
to abolish liturgical worship, services, liturgical service of God, but rather to purify, to purify the one that is now in use. To purify. That was his aim, not to destroy, to reform, to purify, to make better. And so it is that in 1523, Luther's first reform of Christian worship was called the Formula of Missae, the form of the Mass. It was still in Latin, of course. And then three years later, in 1526, he wrote a vernacular service called the Deutsche Messe, the German Mass. And so, and so uh, in our basic statements of belief as Christians in the Lutheran tradition, um, we know that the Book of Concord, Oxford Confession, referred to the service of worship as the Mass. False in our churches are called, are called, are said to abolish the Mass. Well, so much for that, but I, I think most of these names, the Lord's Supper and so on, are fairly obvious what they mean. But what does the word Mass mean for Christian worship? That has a pretty important message to us that I'm going to try to explain to you. I, when I first heard the word Mass, I thought, well, that's what you're your body mass index or something like that, you know, your weight and your height. And you think of mass as being um, something with science, the mass of particles and all that. But actually, the word mass comes from the word, uh, what the deacon used to say is people left service. He would say, ite, missa est. Ite in Latin means go. We get our word itinerary from that. It tells you where you're going to go. And missa est, go, it has been sent. The word missa is from the Latin for to send. To send, you are sent, it has been sent. And we get a lot of words from that uh, Latin word, don't we? We get uh, the word uh, mission, missionary, because these are people who are sent. And even other words in other uh, contexts, come from this word missa, missus. Uh, in in uh, the hospitals, uh, the word uh, in Latin for, for a cross means trans, trans means a cross. So when uh, diseases are spread, they are what transmitted, they're sent across from one person to another. In your car, you have a transmission, don't you? Uh, that sends one gear to another. So this is sort of behind all this word of missa. Um, so the thing of it is, we, the message here is that we are sent after the service. We are, each one of us, to be considered a missionary. A missionary. So when we end and hear the words, go in peace, serve the Lord, they really go in peace and, serve, uh, and uh, fulfill your mission. Fulfill your mission to represent God in your life to all around you. Before Luther, it was thought only the clergy had a mission or a calling. One of the great teachings of the Reformation was and is that we all have a calling. We are all sent. We all have a mission. We all have a mission. And how much the world around today needs this sense of mission. This sense of mission. Today, so many people are building their lives on a foundation of sand. Crass materialism, other things of that nature. We are called, we have the mission to help those around us have a relationship with Christ and build their lives on the firm foundation of faith in God and Him. Think about the people we know, maybe not bad people, but if you look at the commandments, God's commandments, how are they being fulfilled? Remember the first commandment, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Think about the gods people have before the God of heaven and earth. Their possessions, the things they acquire and so on. 
We all have to struggle against that. I admit that. But how much we need to strive to make the God of heaven and earth the God of our lives. How about the second commandment? Not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Well, we try to do that, but in the media today, you see God's name taken in vain all the time. With no thought about it. And how about the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Look at our church this morning. When I came here 53 years ago, it's much larger than it is today, I'll tell you. And we're not throwing stones. We're not casting uh, unkind thoughts. All we're saying is we as individuals and our world today needs God through Jesus Christ more than ever in the past, or at least as much as ever in the past. You know, Luther said that a person's God is that thing or person in which he or she places all the trust and confidence. That's a good definition. What is it in our lives we place our hope and trust and confidence? Is it God or something else? It's Reformation Day, and we celebrate what happened 500 years ago. And uh, I think in some ways we're getting closer and closer to Christians of all denominations. The thing that makes us Christians in fellowship with other Christians is our acceptance of First of all, that Christ is God's Son, and the words of the Apostles' Creed of the Nicene Creed, which we will confess again today. But again, the point on this Reformation Sunday is that we all are have a we all have a calling, we all have a mission, not just the clergy. We are called to be missionaries of the word, state workers, teachers, mothers, fathers. What happened? And that was, was one of the greatest things that we achieved at that time and at that place. The church is always reformed. Let us always be open to uh, information as it comes our way. But whether young or old, well or sick, rich or poor, you have a mission, I have a mission. And that is to shed forth the light and love of Jesus Christ, and help bring others around us who may not share that love, and, that life and love, into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen.
faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as we say together, we, we believe in one God, the Father of all the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Make us free to be the church in the world, God of grace. Form our mission and ministry in ways that truly reflect, reflect our commitment to Jesus Christ. Be with all bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay leaders. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be one with your creation, God of grace. Fill us with your spirit and lead us to use wisely and well what you have given us. Help us to be good stewards of. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be brothers and sisters, God of grace. Help us overcome distinctions that create fear and suspicion. Open our eyes to see the truth that all people of all nations bear the image of God. Be present with our President and Congress, Governor and Legislature. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be ministers of mercy to those in need, and be with all of those who are in sorrow or need, sickness or any other adversity, especially those we now name in our hearts before you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to follow wherever you shall lead us as St. Paul's faith community, knowing that all things work for good in those that love you and trust you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Make us free to be people of hope who believe in the resurrection to eternal life, as we remember those who have gone before us with the sign of faith especially those most dear to us who we now name in our hearts. May light perpetual shine upon them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O Holy One, we entrust all for whom we pray, confident in your abundant and divine mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, with the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Sure, Simon.
Are there any birthdays, anniversaries, important occasions that we need to celebrate, sir? Um, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday, and if you uh, haven't already and would like to have a uh, loved one uh, remembered at the altar, uh, on that occasion there are forms in the back of the church in the basket there you can fill out. Okay. Yes? I did want to say thank you to both you and to Chuck for getting the same tour ready for us today after well, the roof projects. Thank you, Maria. We appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, if you have a chance, uh, go uh, take a look at our new roof. Great new roof. <laughs> and uh, the gutters have been painted. Good for them. And the bell tower has been painted too. So looks looks good. Did the painters do the bell tower? The I mean, uh, roofers did it too. The roofers no, did it first? That's right. Well, the roofer, Carlos, he had some painters come, but, but I don't think the painters were completely comfortable with some of the tip top spots, so the roofers helped out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a joint effort, obviously. <laughs> it, you don't know, this is a very steep roof, if you at least yeah, don't think about it. And they oh, had yeah. ropes around them and over the top with the rest of the roof, so. Uh, but it all worked out very well, and uh, we should have a nice uh, dry winter if we ever get rain, uh, and don't have to worry about uh, little spots here and there as we were. Yeah. Thanks to the congregation for approving the expenditure. I think it's money well spent. And it is, was, and uh, we are fortunate. Uh, Mrs. Youngquist, who was the pastor's wife, Pastor Youngquist was the pastor when this church was built back in 1947. And she passed away this past year at 97 or really up there. Very nice lady. And she left us a certain amount of money in her will, which helped to pay for this. So we're very grateful for that. Good. Okay. Walk in love as Jesus Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
what you have first given us. Ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, in Christ our who on this day were in death and grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way to lasting life. And so, with the church on earth, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this remembrance <coughs> Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this with remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life and compassion, death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and his promise to come again, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we implore you, mercy, to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, that we and all who share in the body and blood of your Son may be filled with heavenly peace and joy in receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be sanctified in soul and body, and have our portion with all your saints. All honor and glory are yours, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us prepare to come to the Lord's table by offering the Lord's prayer, saying with one heart and one voice, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Reveal yourself, O Lord, in the breaking of bread, as one to repeat yourself to your disciples.
May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his precious blood strengthen and preserve, preserve you in true faith and life eternal. Depart in peace.
Mass is ended. Ida Misa Est. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.